uh, thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to present here. Declining an invitation to the Drava National Park would require a long explanation and I'll spare you this explanation. I'm sorry I can't be there and I am glad I can present online uh, anyway. So I would like to um, give an overview of uh, existing legal protection schemes that protect the free flowing character of rivers. And many of them have existed before the Water Framework Directive came into place, let alone we had a discussion on the nature restoration law. Um, so this is looking back a few decades uh, and also looking maybe forward a few moments. Um, and I hope I can get the slides running. Um, yes. Basically, there's just uh, three uh, points I would like to elaborate on, and the longest one will be the second, of course, uh, where I will give you an overview of a study that I've um, produced two years ago um, of where in Europe do we find legal protection schemes for free-flowing rivers, and end with, a, with an outlook and some conclusions. Who? What is this? Wait, there is a... Ah, okay, so, well, yes, okay. I thought I had the wrong presentation going. So the key messages uh, to take home are here on the slide already. We um, we should base the protection of free flowing rivers on their free flowing character. And it should be the central um, element that is then combined with other uh, properties of the river, but it's about connectivity. Connectivity is key, and um, this is important. And it, it's not necessarily reflected in what the Water Framework Directive, for example, um, defines as uh, good status. And as we have heard in the last presentation, there is uh, this is free flowing character is not in itself um, an objective at this point, but in many examples that I show, it is. Um, second point, the examples show that such legal protection is feasible and it has been effective in various countries while different mechanisms, legal mechanisms were used. Um, for the way forward, it's important to combine strict protection of rivers with River Basin Management under the WFT. And um, when we get to the point where dams are removed and river, rivers are restored, it will be essential to make sure these restored rivers are protected so that nobody comes in 30 years and says, we need a dam at the same place, which has happened in the past. Why do we protect rivers? I think the best uh, or one of the nicest uh, Definitions would be from the U.S. Wild and Scenic Rivers Act from 1968 for the benefit and enjoyment of present and future generations. Okay, in my introduction, I'd, of course, I have to mention a few things that are uh, um, endangering rivers, threatening rivers, and uh, this has been said before. Um, we are seeing on this map uh, existing dams, dams under construction and planned dams. Um, this is a study that was conducted, I think, three years ago. Just as a reminder that the pressure is enormous and fragmentation is already enormous. And it is not only the rivers that get fragmented, but with them, the ecosystems and even the species and the individuals, the populations and the individuals. and this is, uh, I should skip this little slide. I, I do not think that small hydropower should be considered as being an overriding public interest, um, but I will not elaborate further on this. I'll let this uh, slide run. It uh, takes a few seconds. Um, freshwater biodiversity, freshwater and river systems is globally the most endangered um, component of biodiversity and uh, the fact that freshwater is so threatened sort of drags down uh, 
uh, the overall global uh, curve of uh, biodiversity decline. Um, you see this in this uh, GIF, uh, but you see it also in more properly uh, referenced in in the Living Planet Index. And um, if you keep in mind that we have planetary boundaries as defined by the uh, Stockholm Resilience Center, then biodiversity is already overshooting those boundaries. And with that, combining the importance of the biodiversity crisis with the fact that freshwater biodiversity is the most uh, endangered at this point, I think rivers and the protection of rivers should be at the core of how we navigate into the future. Coming from WWF, I cannot uh, not show the slide. Uh, uh, bending the curve for freshwater biodiversity is uh, something that we are working on globally. And uh, it's, it's, this is taken from this uh, paper, the um, Emergency Recovery Plan for Freshwater Biodiversity. So letting rivers flow more naturally protecting free flowing rivers and re removing obsolete dams um, are uh, two of the eight, uh, six um, key challenges uh, globally and of course also in, in Europe. This slide shows two definitions of uh, what a free flowing river is. Um, one is the WWF and the Nature Conservancy definition and one is from the EU guidance on barrier removal. Uh, which is connected to the EU biodiversity strategy. So the graph you see on the right uh, illustrates that there are four dimensions of connectivity, of course, longitudinal, then lateral, then vertical and uh, temporal. And um, the guidance document connected to the biodiversity strategy stresses that those four dimensions uh, are what we need to look for and aim for when restoring rivers. This is, of course, very ambitious and will require a lot of discussions how to actually make this happen in certain river stretches. But this is uh, the idea. It's not just about back and forth, but it's all four dimensions that are um, at the key of restoring rivers as free flowing at the core. OK, so with that introduction, I would like to um, give you an overview of uh, existing schemes that protect the free flowing character of rivers in various European countries. Um, so this presentation is based on, a, on an article that I wrote two years ago and was part of a special issue, um, durable protections for free flowing rivers worldwide and this article was an overview to uh, present uh, European experiences um, and I look at uh, a number of countries that you see on, on the map there and I'll go through the individual countries with two slides each. So the first river that received very strict legal protection against dam building and other um, threats to its free-flowing character was the Soča River in Slovenia in 1976. So what you see here in the middle is uh, actually a photo of a real model that was built that, to illustrate the beautiful dam that would create a beautiful lake in the Bovets Valley. It's a clip from a 1964 TV program where this was advertised as a very forward-looking solution for industrializing the valley. Um, this dam, unfortunately, this dam has was never built. And instead, the Socha was uh, protected as a free-flowing river through a law. And uh, this is, on the right, you see basically the site where the dam would have been placed uh, if plans were, had gone forward. So. Don't be afraid that I will read this to you. Um, what I would like to point out is that I looked at uh, those examples with a certain template of how to analyze them. Um, 
and I will just pick out a few things here. Um, so in the case of the Socha River in Slovenia, a law was passed, a law um, was passed by the Socialist Republic of Slovenia within what was then Yugoslavia, of course. And um, it says, this law establishes a protected area for the Socha River and its tributaries in order to protect the waters and the main features of the water regime, thus preserving the biological characteristics of the waters and the natural environment in the area. The protected area covers riverbeds and water and riverbank lands between the source and the confluence with the Idrica River. So here we have a law establishing a protected area in which certain things are protected against specific threats. And this law has been extremely successful and the Socha has uh, um, been protected in this way uh, for many decades. Again, I placed here two pictures from this TV program from 1964, showing what the lake would have looked like. And this is the situation today or a few years ago. Why is the Socha protected? I asked in my interviews a colleague from WWF, and I wanted to understand, you know, what is the mechanism of the law? And he said, because she's beautiful. And I think he was right. This is a very beautiful river and Slovenians are for a good reason proud of it. And um, I think this is what drove people to oppose those uh, projects and uh, made them successful. Finland in 1987 established a law where certain rivers and rapids in the country were spared from hydropower development. Finland is a hydropower country with a lot of hydropower electricity uh, that was um, installed after the war, especially. And Finland experienced something that is in Finland called the rapid wars. So there were quite some controversies about uh, dam projects, and uh, it was in 1987 that a law managed with a law Finland managed to save a number of rivers from hydropower development in this case um, the key quote is for the construction of new hydropower plants no permit required shall be granted so there is a legal provision that no hydropower project can be licensed and therefore the rivers were protected against dam building. Also, um, the state bought up the water rights. So after a couple of years, actually 20 years, I think, um, nobody had a legal base to even apply for a dam building and hydropower exploitation. Also a very successful example. Sweden in 87 went a similar way. Also here, uh, several river stretches and some entire river systems are protected against dam building for hydropower. And the key quote from the text says, hydroelectric power plants, including water regulation or water transfer for power purposes, shall not be carried out. And um, it is quite remarkable that this has also been very successful. Similar to, to Finland, Sweden is a hydropower country I think today 40% of the electricity comes from hydropower. It was much more before nuclear power came in place. And uh, conflicts about these rivers were enormous. And the, um, it was a quite quite a success that these rivers were spared. Uh, the two northern ones, Kalix Elv and Torna Elv, are the largest rivers that are free flowing in um, northern Europe and uh, basically without the Russian rivers, these are the longest rivers that are kept in a free flowing condition. There are two, at least two Russian rivers that are larger, but uh, this is quite remarkable. Okay. Um, two decades later, Spain in, uh, um, introduced what was called, what is called river reserves. Um, this came in place after the water framework directive was um, implemented 
or with the implementation of the Water Framework Directive. And these rivers are small stretches, mostly headwaters, and um, they are preserved in a condition that is, they could, I think they do serve as a reference condition for the, these river types. So here, freshwater protected areas are um, installed in order to preserve those sections with little or no human intervention. They will be strictly limited um, to the actual river corridor, so not so much the floodplain or uh, further uh, adjacent areas, but the rivers are strictly protected to make sure they are in a uh, condition, stay in a condition with little or no human intervention. France finally, um, in within their river basin management plans designated two types of rivers. All river basins had to designate um, those stretches on list one that should be kept free flowing for reasons of sediment transport and ecological con continuity. And on list two, those rivers that should be restored to such condition. And um, by prefectural decree, these lists became legally binding. Um, and it will be very interesting to see how this is carried on in the future because, of course, a lot of opposition rose. But it was quite remarkable to see that France used the Water Framework Directive river basin management plans to establish a nationwide system of uh, protected rivers and those designated to be restored. So these are the examples I wanted to show. And this graph is only to illustrate that there is different mechanisms in different countries to make a similar result uh, come true. So you can establish protected areas, you can designate rivers, uh, you can include or exclude tributaries, headwaters, source streams. Um, but one way is of course is to is to establish a protected area. Whereas in other um, cases you have um, prohibition to uh, license hydropower. Um, there are compensation payments in some cases, and in some cases there is strategic planning involved and river basin management planning involved and others not. And it's a quite a variety of examples. And I think there's a lot to learn from. Altogether, I would summarize that all of these rivers are protected in a very strict way in their free-flowing character. And I think this is something that uh, should be di discussed in the context of the EU biodiversity strategy, what experiences uh, are, um, have been made in, in those countries. So we do have not a European map, but something like a patchwork of strictly protected rivers. and. Uh, how can we expand this to make more sense and how can we enlarge the system? I think that is the question uh, for the near future. We have a system already. We have new approaches evolving in Croatia and Montenegro, in Albania. Um, these existing approaches are based on national legislation uh, from different decades, mostly in reaction to very specific threats and they are sort of disconnected from each other. And therefore, I think a European approach is needed to combine river protection and river revitalization, dam removal, more strategically. A country that is doing this uh, just across the Atlantic is the US. Uh, since 1968, the US has a system of protected waterways called wild and scenic rivers. You see a map on the right. And these are protected and preserved in a free flowing condition. Um, that's the key aspect. And there are other outstanding values that are protected along with the free flowing character. And I think this also should be an inspiration uh, for Europe to see what can we learn from, from the American experience. Um, the tradition is, of course, very different, but 
um, um, we can we also have national parks and in a way you could say the establishment of national parks starting in Yellowstone 1872 was then complemented with the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act to make those rivers protected. And it is not the same necessarily as wilderness. And the Wilderness Act has a different uh, take uh, on, on nature and landscape that we might not as easily apply to, to European landscapes, but those first two uh, are worth looking at. Um, and interestingly, even under the Trump administration, it was possible to designate new rivers as wild and scenic because many people are driving uh, this initiative called 5,000 miles of wild that wants to designate 5,000 more miles of uh, protected rivers. So coming to my conclusions and outlook, um, when we think about protected rivers, the key component is it, the free flowing character and river dynamics. Uh, other outstanding values could be biodiversity, geology, scenery, culture, history. And of course, um, this will be very different in, in, in uh, different situations. I think, however, at least a good status in terms of the water framework directive should be also included as a criterion to designate strictly protected rivers, um, possibly with exceptions if we have rivers in urban settings. What I would imagine we could uh, establish in Europe are three categories of protected rivers. Number one would be free flowing and wild, just probably very few. There could be free flowing and near natural, but European uh, landscapes are uh, reflected in their uh, present state and with agricultural lands nearby and um, not wild, but with free flowing rivers running through them. And uh, thirdly, free flowing rivers that are have been restored because they will never be pristine, um, but they need to be protected to also secure the investments that society makes into dam removal and uh, restoration of continuity. Tobias? Yes. Two minutes, please. Yes, okay. So how can we come up with a vision a, a, for, for a network, a European network? That's a question for, on, for discussion. How many rivers would we like to see protected in which biogeographical setting uh, and how, oh, my clock is already reminding me um, that I'm over time. Um, how can we establish a mechanism that guarantees strict protection for the future? Those are the key questions uh, to build a European network. Um, I think an inspiration for Europe is Albania. The Viosa became a Wild River National Park just a month ago, an incredible success of a wonderful and very powerful uh, campaign, Save the Blue Heart of Europe. And I think this is something we should look at more closely and see how we can transfer this idea to other rivers in Europe. The older river you see it in, in the, my background, it's very, it's my closest river from where I'm sitting now, is of course one river that would need better protection. Uh, we have different alternatives on the table and uh, you can already spot the difference of what is happening right now as we speak. Sturgeons in our view, WWF, you should be flagship species for free flowing rivers. Um, I won't elaborate any further on that, but uh, it is great to see that the first individuals are trying to re-enter the Elbe River uh, in the last years. And uh, let's hope we can get a population in that river that is self-sustaining in the future. Why do we protect the rivers? I think we do it for the love of rivers and uh, many people enjoy rivers for different reasons. I think it is good to be honest about that and celebrate 
this passion that we have. One last quote from a famous novel by Hermann Hesse. You probably all know it. The river is everywhere at once, at the source and at the mouth, at the waterfall, at the ferry, at the rapids, in the sea, in the mountains, everywhere at once. And we're all in the same boat. And the time for rivers is now. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>